Okay, so today's lecture is going to mark uh, a bit of a handoff, a handoff between more intensive coverage of the agent base modeling side and a mark of shifting, pivoting to return to a discussion of aggregate system dynamics modeling, um, where we're capturing the dynamics of simulations, not with individuated agents, but instead with stocks, flows, accumulations, feedbacks. And we're going to use that next module also to deepen our understanding of the mathematics and the structures associated with contagion, with many of those ideas carrying over to agent-based modeling. Now, not only does this lecture mark a bit of a handoff point in that relay race, passing the baton to the next module here, but it also, speaks to the, the underlying unity of some of these ideas when we're dealing with systems out there in the world. I introduced to you the idea that models are learning tools and models are not enshrined in the activities in the, of the world that we're characterizing with them. The phenomenon in the world and the, 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 the rules that govern them, the logic and structure that governs them is not of course limited to one of these traditions or another. Each of these traditions provides a fruitful set of tools for characterizing classes of systems for certain types of questions. And there may be features of, of of systems, um, high level of path dependence, for example, dependence on past history, prominence of network type connections and driving dynamics, impact of spatial context, impact of localized perception of individuals, there may be some aspects governing the dynamics that recommend, for example, for those cases, agent-based modeling, or there may be some aspects of the questions we're interested in asking. The relationship between an individual's history, for example, and their outcome, which again might motivate agent-based modeling or intervention questions about intervening at a certain place in a network impact of intervening at this place in a network or that one. Having a smoking cessation program promoted by popular kids in school versus, or, you know, smoking prevention program versus, um, um, versus uh, others in that network um, may have a difference. Or we may be a look at interest and look at outcomes that depend on those structures that, that might recommend certain methods. But the world has, the phenomena in the world that we're characterizing with these models have no inherent methodological uh, specificity. They're, they're phenomena that we conveniently describe with some of these methods perhaps, but they don't come themselves labeled with and are not limited to or beholden to any one method. And today we'll see that when it comes to the dynamics of these systems that we may characterize with agent-based modeling, often there are features of them that whisper to us of the possibility of, of, of characterizing them in a simpler form with fewer moving parts. There may be certain 
conservation properties. There may be certain symmetries. There may be just certain constraints on the system that end up meaning that a simpler description is possible, that a more parsimonious characterization, which just a few stocks and flows, for example, gives a thoroughly adequate characterization for the questions we're bringing to the table. And today's discussion is going to, to look at that issue through the lens of a contemporary, prominent contemporary need, which is the need to understand systems in the world through data. We're gonna talk about this relationship between these underlying processes, their inherent structure, which we're trying to learn about with models, and the phenomena that we observe empirically, that we directly see. So I'd like to jump into this. This is a deep topic. I'm only going to be able to give reference to the components of it. We will return to this topic in bits later, where we'll be talking about in our next module some aspects of equilibria, situation where the system's at ba in balance. We're going to be talking there some about different types of equilibria, different basins of attraction the system can be in. But we'll see those indicated in data produced by agent based modeling. So let's dive into this if we could. So I'm going to share my screen here and go over to our, our slides here. So Today's set of slides have a real mouthful for where the names state space. They're going to introduce notions of what we call state space or phase space, an alternative characterization of system behavior, intrinsic dimensionality versus nominal dimensionality of a system the how much of its possible degrees of freedom the system is actually exercising um because of symmetries because of conservation laws etc they may be a lot fewer than we think because of constraints involving interagent interaction and we're going to be talking about using empirical data from the world to tell us something about the structure of the underlying drivers for that system. We're going to use observations in the world that will hint to us, will whisper to us about the structure of the processes giving rise to that data. I suspect that virtually all of you in this class will have heard considerable amounts of excitement about the increasingly data-driven nature of, of science, about how increasingly, because of the proliferation of electronic mechanisms, computational tools to monitor them, the widespread availability of portable electronics devices and easily embeddable systems in the world. Many aspects of the world that were subject to more informal, occasional observations are increasingly providing rich sources of data, whether it's aspects of animal behavior, components associated with natural phenomenon, you know, the, the movement of seismic plates or, or atmospheric you know, movement in, the, in weather, whether it's aspects of people's health behavior and, and 
in contact behavior or or behavior in terms of um, mobility and, and interaction with their environment, uh, exposure to online materials and to to um, uh, to elements of the world, uh, to pollution, et cetera. Increasingly, we, we have a data rich way of collecting information on these. And I'm pleased that in our group, we've contributed to elements like that, but with tools like smartphone based data collection or social media harvesting, et cetera. But when we think about this, it, it bears noting that from the perspective of this class, and indeed from a, a, a deeper philosophical perspective, we have some external world out there, which we're trying to study. And that world is evolving in a fashion characteristic of a dynamical system, and typically a nonlinear dynamical system. It's evolving in a fashion where how it changes over the next little bit depends on its state, which is a common, although not universal, definition of a dynamical system. What happens in the next little bit? Who gets infected? Who recovers? Depends on who's susceptible and infected now, and you know who's in the later stages of their infection now, for example. So we have these systems out there in the world, these dynamical systems, which are evolving. But we as human actors don't have the luxury of directly knowing in some transcendent way about the nature of those underlying processes. Instead, we build models to try to probe our understanding, try to see if we could build effective models of these systems. But science has always benefited from the ability to measure as well. And so we can, we can apply measurements that pick up aspects of certain areas of the system. They can, they can give evidence about what's going on over here, over here, over here within the system are almost like little probes that we could use to characterize what's going on, whether it's flow rates in the South Saskatchewan River or measuring someone, a patient's temperature and heart rate and oxygen saturation levels, measuring at various parts around the city, the number of, or the, the wind speed and the temperature uh, and the rate of precipitation whether it's characterization of the count of mosquitoes that are in different areas of the city as gathered by mosquito traps put out uh, every few days. We have these measurements coming in from the world. And these measurements are incomplete. They're often delayed. Think about mosquito traps that gather mosquitoes for three days before you can count them by going and collecting them manually. They're in continuous, they're non-continuous typically, even fast receiving sensors like accelerometers on my smartphone might only sample, you know, a couple dozen times a second, for example. Um, they're, they're incomplete, they're noisy, there are gaps. And sometimes they're erroneously attributed to, um, we mistake one phenomenon for another, for example. Um, but they provide us a glimpse of what's going on here. And through that observation, we can quantify things, we can plot them out. And the burgeoning field of data science deals with these massive volumes of data, which are increasingly commonly too large for traditional databases and architectures to handle conveniently and require novel techniques, novel architectures, et cetera. And machine learning and other tools seek to make sense of this and modeling does as well. So our models operate up here and 
Soon enough, we'll be learning about processes like model calibration, which will tune a model to best accord with data we observe from the world. But this data does not spring like uh, Apollo from, from Zeus's head directly out of uh, the world with perfect knowledge of the world. It, it comes from certain areas of a system, not others. So we might know about the number of people who have COVID-19 and are symptomatic, especially those who are very serious symptoms and may come forward. But we don't know about a vast number of them that are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. And we may not even know about those who are testing positive and rapid antigen tests at home. And we don't have a, an easy way to measure the number susceptible on a daily basis. Now, much of our lecture is going to be about this continuum here. And in order to move us there, I want to talk about a construct that I haven't really, it's possible I alluded to it at some point, but I haven't really brought your attention to it. And that's the concept of, of model state space. The idea is that when we have a model, a simulation model, one of these tools that help us think about what's going on down here, help us make sense of the data we've collected, that model has some set of stakes associated with it, some set of possible configurations for it, some set of possibilities about what is the current situation in the model. Um, so for example, in a little system dynamics model, we might have a count of susceptibles, a count of infectives, and a count of temporarily immune people. In an agent-based model, we might, for example, have lynxes and hairs where each hair has a very simple state, they're, they're alive or, or dead, and each lynx is in a somewhat more complicated state. They're either satiated and resting happily, or they're periodically going out and hunting, um, uh, but they are going and remaining in this state for some period of time uh, and eventually pass away. This model is posted and we'll be using it. Other models, we've had you know, people states, state of each person, for example, being something associated with infection or associated with infection and location. Here, the state space is considerably larger, right? For each person, for example, here, they might be in one of four states. Person A in one of four states, or person one in one of four states, person two in one of four states, person three in one of four states. And if you think about it, with one person at four states, with two people, the first could be in any of the four, the second could be in any of the four, and you have 16 possibilities, right? Any of the four for the first, any of the four for the second. With three people, you have four to the third possibilities, or 64 possibilities. Four times four times four. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go on from there, 256, et cetera, with just five people. Mm. Um, so here we have this state space that kind of indicates the set of all possibilities. And in a aggregate model, for example, like this, it is a particular, it's a particularly sort of easy way to, to show it. We might have 
a count of susceptibles here, a count of infectives here, and a count of temporarily immune people. That's this one. You could call them R if you find that simpler, R along here. And at any one point in a model like this, there's a certain number here, that would be the point along this x, this x, s axis, a certain number here that would indicate the location along the, the i axis, and a certain number here, indicating the number along this north, this up down axis. So at any one time, the model is a certain number here, here, and here, and that defines one point in this space. Mm -hmm. So at any one time, the model is at some specific point here, you know, some specific value here, here, and here that dictate the coordinates. And over time, it evolves in this state space, right? Um, so each independent element of model state is associated with this state space. And a given run of the model arcs out this trajectory in state space. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll notice here that this, while well, this is a way of depicting the behavior of the model, the evolution of the model, it's quite different from how we've traditionally depicted it. If I were to go, for example, to, and I, I posted a model, um, that's much like this one. It's a um, SIRS model, I think, uh, uh, with crowding disparities in state space. It's on the, the website. But you know, traditionally, we've had a model characterized by behavior over time where one of the axes was time. And we might have, for example, a count of people getting newly infected here or a fraction of people that are infected along the y-axis, right? And when we ask about behavior, we're asking about how it's evolving over time as viewed by this graph or this graph. And that's one way of understanding model behavior that's central. Behavior over time as shown by graphs of time versus variables, and that's very useful, but it's not the only way of, of showing a model's state or of, or excuse me, showing its behavior over time, or summarizing its behavior over time. There are other ways, and this shows another way of characterizing it. Time here is implicit. There's no time axis. Time does run here, there's sort of an arrow leading down this way, so to speak. And as it evolves, it goes around here. But it may spend a while here and then go on. Um, and here it goes down into this equilibrium. Um, if we have a model, we could depict it in one way or we could depict it in another way. Now, in a point I'm gonna come back to, for an agent-based model, the state space is more involved to depict. Here, I have one axis for the count of people who are susceptible and another axis for the count of people who are currently infected. I could plot at any one time where the model is in this state space. Again, at any one time, there'll be a count of susceptibles and a count of infectives, and maybe the model is right here, for example. Let me ask you, for an agent-based model, is this a complete characterization of the state of the model? Does this presence of the model at this point completely tell me the state of the model. Can anyone offer a comment on that?
I'll try to call up the chat. Anyone want to offer a comment? Does BIG at a certain point here, a certain count of infectives, a certain count of, of, of excuse me, infectives, certain count of susceptibles, does that totally tell you the state of the model? Matthias says no, and Matthias is correct. What does that leave out? The count of susceptibles and the count of infectives. What does it what does it leave out of the the situation? Well, it leaves out who is infected, right? Are, are the are the uh, 75 infected people, for example, the people in the central piece of the network, or are they folks way out in the periphery? Are they disconnected people? Or are they people who have tons of connections? It's evolution over the next little bit might really depend on that, right? Um, so you can't really say just the count of susceptibles and count of infectives jointly specifies the entire state of the model. The entire state of the model is much bigger to depict than we could depict in two dimensions. You know, conceptually, we need a dimension for person one, person two, because any combination of them in theory could happen. We need a dimension for person three. We need to get another dimension for person four. If we were dealing with a thousand people in the population, as we are here, we need a thousand dimensions in our plot to show the state of an age-based model. But for a small system dynamics model, it's you know, with three stocks, you could plot it out in three dimensions, no problem. Now this may cause Puzzlement, and you may say, well, um, okay, so this is a three-dimensional system. Asia-based model is many, many, has tons of more dimensions. What of it? Well, we'll come to this. It's all about this learning from the world and about what we can deduce from the world, actually, because it's a lot more subtle issue than you think. Um, okay, so we have this notion of state space, but there's more to it than meets the eye. So we have this three-dimensional state space. At any one time, undeniably, the state of the system could be mapped out here. The state of this system could be summarized here, but it's a summary that's incomplete. It's a, it's a gross sort of summary. It's a gross aggregate summary that leaves out lots of details, that obscures lots of details. But it's a summary and it's useful. It's just not a complete description. Here it's a complete description. But this is what I wanna tell you about this. If you look at this model, take, it, take a look at it. You know, people getting infected, once they get infected, they can infect others, they, they recover. And after some period of time, they go back to susceptibles. Make a note of that structure when I show you this next picture, because this is a three-dimensional picture of state space viewed from one specific angle. And now I'm just going to rotate it to view it from another angle. You know, twist it and, and look at it from another angle. And this is what I'll see, ladies and gentlemen. All I did is I took my head, my virtual head, and I sort of looked at it from somewhere down here. I looked at it from an outer angle. And this is what I see. This is the same picture just looked at from a different from a different perspective, from a different angle. What is that telling me? Does anyone say if, if I look at a 
two-dimensional object, or sorry, a, 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 a nominally three-dimensional object, let's say this, this envelope. Here it is at three dimensions. There it is. Looks looks bulky, but then I, I I let you view it, and this is what you see. What is that telling you about this object? Anyone? What is that telling you? If it if it looks like really really big and bulky, and then you look at it, and it looks like this, what is it telling you about kind of its intrinsic dimensionality about its its real shape anyone want to say what is this this is like a what in three dimensions it's like a there's a number of words we could use for it one begins with p and ends with e anyone want to make a comment on that it's like a plane yeah it's like a plane this is this is in 3d right it's it's in three dimensions but it's intrinsically planar. I mean, it's, it's basically like a 2D thing just embedded in three dimensions. So I'm saying that this state space um, here, um, this state space, which I, oh, sorry, that I depicted, looks like this if we look at from the right angle. So what is that telling us about this model actually? If if we look at the data this this produces and it looks you know we put it in 3D at state space how it evolves in its state we put it in 3D it's undeniably able to be embedded in 3D like this it can be placed in 3D no problem right it's, one value for this, this, and this for, for each point, and it can evolve. Great. But if if we look at that and we say, wait a minute, it's really a plane. It's really a plane. What is that telling us about this model? Can anyone want to say? What is it whispering to us about this model? What is it, what is it yelling at us about this model? Well, it's yelling that this model does not exercise the full three dimensions. In fact, all it exercises is two dimensions. And does anyone, in other words, two numbers are enough to specify the state of this model. Two numbers, not three. It doesn't require three numbers to specify the full state of this model. Just two is enough, enough to locate us on this plane. This, like, uh, to, to specify where I am on this envelope, I just have to specify something like here or something like here, right? Two numbers will be enough. It may be in three dimensions, but two numbers are enough to tell me where I am on this plane. Two numbers are enough to tell me where I am on this plane. We're just looking at a two dimensional structure from the side. Why is why are two numbers enough to tell me that here? Can anyone tell me? What is it about the structure of the model that allows two numbers to be enough to fully specify its state? Mm hmm? Someone should be able to say that. What is it about the structure of this model that means if you give me two numbers, I can tell you the third? I'll give you a hint. Ah, okay. It's yeah, one state is linearly depending on the others. Yes. That's true. There is a balancing, and, and Harriet is right to mention the balancing. The balancing actually goes on here where it's in balance. So that actually tells you there's a there's an equilibrium that it's that that is involved, and that's actually a very important feature of this state space too. But it turns out that, as Tony was saying, there's a 
conservation involved in, in a way. The state is, one aspect of state is linearly dependent on the others, as he put it. So if I know the total population, here, if, I, if I knew the total population is a thousand, I could determine this by doing what? Can anyone say, if, if, if I told you the total population is a thousand, how could, and I told you S and I, how can I tell you what TI is? Yeah, total population, well, it's the total pop minus S minus I will give you this because the population is conserved. There, it has to be in either S or I or T. We know it's in one of them. So if you give me yes, the amount that's in S and I, the rest has to be in T, right? It's gotta be one of these places. No one's dying. No one's coming in. It's gotta be in one of these places. And the value in the third place can be determined from the total population minus the sum of the other two. Just two numbers are enough. If you know the total population, two numbers are enough to specify this. Two numbers are enough. We don't need three numbers. That's overkill. The third number is given by the total population minus the sum of the other two. As Tony said, the state is one aspect of state is linearly dependent on the others. So this system is nominally three dimensions, but it's intrinsically two dimensional. You, you would say, well, there's three stocks. You say, yeah, but conservation properties. Remember, I, I, I mentioned in my opening remark, conservation properties, symmetries, coupling. These all lead the total possibilities to be a lot larger than the ones that are actually exercised, the ones that are actually sort of, uh, in fact, realized, actualized. So here, there's three degrees of freedom nominally, three, you know, you could have S any value, I any value, and it's easy to think you have T any value, but, but no, there are these constraints and the constraints here are ones of conservation. You know, if you know an S and I, it, it tells you T has to be something to, total population. By contrast, here's a system where we have susceptible effect of recovered and we have, we have these flows out. And so this plus this plus this is not just equal to some fixed number. Here it was equal to a, a fixed number, a thousand. They're either at any one time, that's thousand are divided into these three categories. And it was just a, a fixed number. Here we don't have a fixed number. And so we can't, we, we can't just completely determine this from you know a thousand minus that because it, it varies. Um uh they, they they all vary. Now um so uh ladies and gentlemen, these types of Plots I've generated here are from a model. These are model generated plots. But we have similar phenomena from the world. It should get you thinking because even though this is generated by the model, like in principle, with enough, you know, legwork, shoe leather, you know, you could could go around measuring these things, right? And, and track this about a system. And what this is saying is like, the data that I could collect from a system will whisper to me about how many degrees of freedom it has, how, how, how many aspects of its underlying state there really are. And that should make you think, because what it's saying is like, what we see up here is whispering to us about what's going on, about, about the nature of the system, the intrinsic nature of the system, not about our models of the system, but about the intrinsic nature. If we see data from the world that has this characteristic, 
this was data generated by a model, but I just use it to build the intuitions. If we saw data from the world that had this characteristic, that it looked, you know, it had nominally three dimensions, but when we look at it as two, it's telling us something about this underlying system that there's really only two degrees of freedom. There's only two sets of degrees of freedom by which it can vary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so scientists have known about these phenomena for a while. And when we deal with dynamical systems, often we'll plot things out in a way that is just like the state space. And, and during the pandemic, I would come across these graphs quite a bit. So here's daily reported cases and daily reported deaths. Not quite state aspects, but change in state, right? Um, new cases, or new deaths. And you would see the system's behavior arced out in this data. It's behavior indicated. Notice that just like these, there's no time axis here, but we are depicting the system's behavior, right? And it's using the coloration here to indicate earlier or older, you know, earlier or more recent, so older or newer observations from the system. So the system looks like it went like this, and, and out here it had this interesting retrograde motion, and it, and it came back here. Here's another example, hospitalizations in the UK, daily admissions versus beds full in the UK. This is kind of a bit of a flow, this is a bit of a stock, but the same principle applies. And scientists came up with you know, some wonderful ways of kind of using these plots to, to capture the structure. Now, it turns out that the structure of these plots turns out to tell you a lot. Like what we see is the structure of, in, of these patterns in the data tells you a lot about the structure of this underlying system, just as this tells you about the structure of this system that gave rise to this data. So these observations to the world tell us a lot about this system. In fact, these plots give us a way of peering into the structure of the processes that are operating here. Not into our models, no, 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 into the structure of the underlying processes that are giving rise to this data. The data whispers to us, it hints to us, it nudges us about what processes give rise to it. And that's why these things are so useful. And that's why these things capture these kind of regularities in a way that's insightful. We can also follow them as you might follow the path of a hurricane, for example, on a map and project it forward. Easier done here than if you're just looking at plots over time. Here are you know, cases in the past week and change of cases compared to last week. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is from a noisified version of Saskatchewan's data from our fair province. And what you see is successive waves for the pandemic sort of arced out here. And there are these trajectories. The system doesn't jump around willy nilly, you know, just every day being independent of the others. No, it's a dynamical system. How it is tomorrow will reflect how it is now and some change from now. And the system evolves in some regular orderly fashion over time. And graphs like this can, can bring that out. But it turns out they do so by, by whispering to us about the underlying state of the system. Because these graphs, are guaranteed to be, if they're constructed the right way, such as here, they're guaranteed to basically be a stretched, sort of twisted version. They can be stretched and twisted, but they're 
as, as the mathematical term is homeomorphic to, they're sort of a stretched and twisted version of the state space of the underlying system that gives rise to them. So they basically tell you about this, the state of the system that's giving rise to them. Now, pop back to ABMs, to ABMs, ladies and gentlemen, to ABM. So we have this ABM and each person can nominally be in any state. And it's got a hideously large number of all possibilities, right? Person, person one in any of those four states, person two in any of those four states, person three in any of those four states, person four in any of those four states. And you would rightfully disconnect if I went on to person a thousand. But there too, there are regularities. There too, there are constraints. There too, there are conservation properties and laws that mean the actual exercise state space is incredibly smaller than the nominal one. Because for example, people in the population have to be in one of those states and because people can infect each other and one person is not a solitude from others. In ABMs, the nominal dimensionality of state space grows geometrically with the count of agents. I just said it, right? Four possibilities for one agent, four times four for two, four times four times four for three, and so on. We may deal with state space diagrams that state space diagrams that summarize ABM state, and those are useful, but they are summarized. But typically, these models only occupy a small, small sliver of state space, just as this envelope, ladies and gentlemen, only occupies a small, small portion of its surrounding three-dimensional space. The world of the ABM is often etched out in just a small sliver of this magnificently large space of possibilities because of conservation, symmetry, but especially coupling. The chance that one person would, re would remain infective while wired in with tremendous numbers of others is so small that it really doesn't go many places that it could in principle go in, ter in terms of its current state. It only occupies a thin area of space. It doesn't go to these kind of vanishingly unlikely areas of space. So I loaded up on our Canvas site this predator-prey agent-based modified for state space. Don't forget that. Version 7, a model worthy of its name. And this model is a model of predation, ladies and gentlemen, predation. So we have lynxes and we have hares. The model is inspired by the records that were noted in by the Hudson Bay Company in Northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan amongst other places, but I think particularly there, where Hudson Bay Company being in the business of, of selling furs and, 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 and trapping and, and trying, to, trying to make money was concerned about that its sources of income will be reliable. And so if you download this model and you run it, here, this version seven of the model, um, you'll notice that after some initial transients where the hairs are initially small, then they multiply. And I should really give the, the factors that govern this first. So each hair is, as we said before, alive or dead. And it goes around and it moves around and it, it, seeks, to, it seeks to eat here. Okay, um, uh, 
And meanwhile, and it's in a certain cell, and it 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 moves between uh, between cells in search of food. Okay. Um, and so these are the hairs, these small green, green dots. And the links, ladies and gentlemen, here are, are these creatures that, as we noted, are more complicated. And they hunt after these, these hairs here. Um, and uh, by going and hunting uh, every so often, uh, they can eat if they find a hair in their cell, um, uh, for example, uh, and, uh, and they go and kill the, uh, the prey and, and they consume them. Um, and that allows um, a new lease of life. They go out of the state and they come back in, right? Um, but if they have no luck, um, they'll go right back into here. So they're looking around to eat, and if it's too long between since they last eat, if they go beyond a death threshold in days, they die of 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 hunger, right? And otherwise, they die of old age due to Link's life expectancy. Now, a model like this with these hairs running around and with these links running around, um, uh like the systems of the world, the snowshoe hares and, and uh, the paw area of northern Manitoba and lynx tracking after them, um, they, uh, they have a complex interaction, a complex spatial interaction. But they give rise to behavior over time that exhibits many regularities, a great deal of orderliness. And you'll notice here, if I plot out the number of hairs and the number of links, you'll notice what the Hudson Bay trappers or the Hudson, and the Hudson Bay administrators, merchants noted, which is that there can exhibit marked fluctuations year to year in the number of hairs and the number of links that are extant. So for example, in this year, um, you might have 5,000, somewhere under 5,000 hairs, whereas in, uh, a, you know, a, a little bit later, you have, you know, somewhere upwards, of, it looks like, you know, 6,700 or 6,500 lengths, excuse me, hairs. Um, so you get these big fluctuations in hairs and fluctuations in lengths. And running this, uh, Going forward, you'll notice that these are not just willy nilly, you know, uh, uh, transitions that are just totally chance event. There's some structure there that leads to the fluctuations occurring with a certain rough frequency and sort of oscillating around a certain equilibrium. These, these up and down fluctuations. fluctuations that induced fluctuations in the availability and ultimately the price, for example, for hair or lynx pelts for the Hudson Bay Company. Now, this is a complex agent-based model. We could depict a summary of its state space and we'd find that it's sort of circulating around a quasi equilibrium quasi-equilibrium where there's something like 5,800 hairs, a little bit short of that maybe, and something like 740 links. And it's kind of circling around this equilibrium in a kind of, uh, in, a, in, a semi, in a somewhat stochastic way. And if you plot it out, in this projected state space, this kind of projected summary state space, you may see something like that, but sometimes we'll see something um, that's, that's also interesting. The appearance of a, another competing equilibrium with a somewhat different, somewhat higher number of hairs and, uh, and, and a, a different number of lengths as well. 
Uh, now, it turns out that these structures emerge from the model as equilibria. And we can take data from the model and, and analyze it and find aspects of these equilibria. But it turns out that the situation is, is such that when you have these systems, even a small bit of data, data from just one area of the system can tell you about what's going on in the broader system as it affects many features of that system. We're gonna come back to this. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna uh, skip through this, but I, I want to note that when it comes to state space, we have this real distinction between the nominal dimensionality and the intrinsic dimensionality. And even descriptively complex systems like, like this one with you know, uh, hairs and links interacting in space and chasing each other, you get regularities of behavior that are kind of low dimensional that involve you know, waves, for example, of links, waves of hairs. And you get summaries of the state space that exhibit much regularity, where, for example, it's going around an equilibrium. Okay. It's, it's, it's circling around some state of balance, as Harriet referred to earlier, where the system is in some sense in balance. So in short, even a, even a very complex state with tons of lengths, tons of particular lengths, tons of particular hairs, you know, has this lower level structure, this kind of simpler structure to it, which is not perfect. It doesn't provide a perfect description and it does not provide an exact description of the state, but it leads the system to exhibit a more constrained behavior and a set of patterns that are simpler than you might think. For example, patterns in the count of errors and count of links themselves gross summaries of a very complex system, which have these large regularities. It gives to rise to these kind of laws for the aggregate system that are that transcend anything what's going on at the level of a frightened hare fleeing a lynx. And we see indications of that in the data data over time and in this kind of summarized state space that we see with links versus hairs. So we have a nominal dimensionality here, which is giant, which is magnificently large, involving each conceivable possibility for each hair in isolation and each link in isolation, right? For this other model we looked at, you know, four times four times four times four, et cetera, possibilities. And, you know, with a number of those multiplies equal to the number of people in the population. But we have an intrinsic dimensionality that's, smart, that's much smaller than that, that's much more limited and which exhibits high level patterns that relate how links is coupled with other links and coupled with hairs and and it induces these high level patterns that keep what's going on in one lynx very similar to what's going on in other lynxes or hairs and, and lynxes. They're not all independent. It's not just four times four times four times four as, as a set of possibilities. It could realistically, it could be at any time. There's so much coupling. It's a much, much, much smaller set of those possibilities it could actually be likely to be in. Okay, um, and you'll recall that sometimes there are these conservation properties and symmetry that lead it to be, you know, smaller dimension as well. Now, now when we have these systems, these are, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more in coming weeks. These are coupled, nonlinear systems. Hairs and links affect each other. Hairs depend on links for their sustenance. 
links depend on evading hairs to stay alive. They are coupled together. One lynx eating a given hair prevents another lynx from eating that hair. The lynx are coupled through that. If one hair has lots and lots of buddies, they're less likely to be eaten because one of the other buddies may, may be gotten before they are. If they're the only hair around and there's a thousand hungry lynx, they're one scared hair, right? There's coupling going on. What's going on with one hair matters for other hairs. What's going on with one lynx matters for other lynx. What's going on with the lynxes matter for the hairs. We have these coupled systems. And they're nonlinear. The number of new infectives depends not only on the number of infectives in the last little bit, but the number of susceptibles. It takes two to tango. New infections take a new infective and uh, take an infective and a susceptible. I'll be coming back to that, but uh, in a in a future lecture. But the evolution of this system is is state dependent, and the evolution of one of how the links evolve depends on the hairs and how the hairs evolve depend on the links right again if there's a thousand links how the hairs uh, and, and only one hair how it evolves is going to depend a lot on those links and and vice versa now what this means is like if we think about variables in the system the evolution of one variable depends on the other. Even if we, and I'm gonna apologize for going back here, way to the beginning, even if we go back to that very first SITS model, you know, what's going on with S depends on these other ones, right? This, it's not totally independent of the other. What's going on here depends on these. What's going on here depends on these. And, and in the, in the Lynxes and hairs, we get this similar dependence. So there's this entangling thing, and it means that you know one hair is not totally independent of the other. The state of one person in that infection spread model is not totally independent of the other. If I'm infective, there's a and, and I'm connected with with you and you and you. There's a higher than average chance that several of you are infective as well. Hopefully less so since I'm staying at home. Um, but if, you know, if they're in that network, there's this entangling going on. Knowing about my state tells me a lot about your state if you're connected to me. Um, and it turns out that in simple systems, In simpler systems, systems that are like stock and flow systems, you can actually see this directly. So we can write down, for example, with predator prey, one, one popular way of writing this down is we have, say, lynxes and, uh, lynxes and hares, and lynxes grow at a certain rate alpha. Um, this is their birth rate. They and lynxes, lynxes, so this is hairs, the hairs grow at a certain rate alpha, lynxes die off at a certain death rate alpha. And then there's some um, interactions. So hairs, if they interact with lynx, they die off, that's why it's a minus sign, but lynxes have bigger litters of, and there's a name for a baby lynx that I don't recall, maybe called a kit, I can't recall, um, a cub or something, but it, it uh, kitten, um, uh, but if if uh, lynx interacts with the hair, it leads to more lynx so and increases the rate of change, increases the rate of the, the, the growth, the rate of growth of the lynx population. That's why there's no minus here. But what this is saying is like the rate of change of, of hairs depends on the number of hairs and the number of hairs times the number of links. And if you, if you think about it, we can actually take this and we could solve for it. So for example, if we take this first equation, um, we could rearrange it just by bringing this thing over to this side and this one to that side, right? 
And then we could solve for y from this thing. There's only one y appears only one place. And we could solve for it in terms of, so this is the count of lanes. We could solve for the count of lanes in terms of these things only involving hair. So if you tell me what this is saying is, if these laws are correct, if you tell me the number of hairs right now, number of hairs, and you tell me the rate of change of the number of hairs, is it going up by five hairs a month or going down by five hairs a month? That's x dot. That's the derivative of the number of hairs over time. It's the rate of change over time. If you tell me the number of hairs and the rate of change of hairs, I can compute for you the number of lengths there must be around. If this is a set of factors that govern the interaction of lengths and hairs, if this is how lengths affect hairs, I know a lot about lengths by observing the hairs. If the hair population is, is for example, very, very large right now, uh, and and uh, there's, if it's extremely large and there's not a particularly pronounced rate of change of, of lengths, we're going to have this cancel with this, the X is here, and we're going to have a lynx population of alpha over beta. If the hair population is dropping really, really quickly right now, that tells me about something about the lengths around. The fact that that the hair population is is dropping very quickly tells me something about how many links uh, must be around right now. And similarly, I could do the same for computing based on the number of links around how many hairs there must be. If links are growing really, really quickly, if y dot is really big, so we're getting more and more links growing, it tells me that the population of hairs must be quite large because otherwise links wouldn't be growing, right? Like if the links are growing like gangbusters, I may not have direct observations about hairs, but if these equations are true, it suggests to me that hairs, there must be a lot of hairs around to support those links, right? Um, uh, so here, ladies and gentlemen, Knowing about the dynamics of lynx population tells us a lot about the hair population. It tells us lynx are growing like crazy. It tells us there must be a lot of hairs around to sustain them. Okay, so it turns out that when we have these systems, these coupled systems, knowing about the value of one the rate of change of one variable can tell us about a lot about the behaviors. Um, knowing about the behavior of one state variable tells us about others. Knowing a lot of, about the links tells us about the hairs. Knowing about the hairs tells us about the links. These two are so coupled, they're so intertwined that knowing about one tells us about the other. Inevitably, because they depend on each other. When you have that coupling, You can learn about other areas of the system by listening in one area of the system. Listening in one area of the system will whisper to you about the others. You know, if you, if you have a lot of people getting West Nile virus, it tells you a lot about, there must be a lot of infected mosquitoes along and probably a lot of infected birds around. If you see birds dropping out of the sky because of West Nile, and this happens, it tells you a lot of mosquitoes must be infected as well. And it turns out this, this is a very practical matter for empirical data. Um, so when we have observations from empirical data from one area of the system, ladies and gentlemen, one stinking area of the system, it tells us about what's going on in many areas of the system. We have data about links. It tells us about hair. All we need is data about links, and we know a lot about hair, is the idea. And you may say, well, okay, that depended on your model and so on. But it turns out 
that it's intrinsic in data from a coupled system that this is true. If it's from this coupled system, there is information content and observation about X, let's say hairs, tells you about the things affecting X, if you know how to listen to it. If you just know how to listen, it'll tell you about it. It will whisper you to you about this missing thing. And there's a famous mathematical result named after Dutch mathematician Floris Takens, which basically says, look, under a broad set of conditions, you can reconstruct the structure of the underlying state space. That the underlying dynamics of the system in the world using a single time series from that system. So you give me a measurement of hairs over time, I can reconstruct the state of that system over time, the state space, how it's evolving in state space. And this is true for a broad class of these coupled nonlinear dynamical systems. And how do you do it? How do you learn how to listen in the right way to deduce this understanding about the broad system? Well, you make use of a technique known as delay embedding. You have a time series, right? Um, single time series, call it Y. So we have y of zero, y of one, y of two, y of three. Suppose we have y of t. We're gonna turn each time point in that time series, except for the very ones at the, the end, which don't have preceding ones. We're gonna take, for each time point, we can create a vector that consists of the value at that time t, the value at time t minus tau, the value at time t minus two tau, the value at time t minus three tau, and so on to t minus n t. Okay, so, so each time point, you create a vector. And the elements of that vector are the current, the value at that, that time, value the time tau time, time tau before it, two time before it, Maybe tau is one, for example, in which case this would be the value of time t, value at time t minus one, value at time t minus two, value at time t minus three, and time t minus four, for example. That'll be a five vector, a vector of five elements. And that would be a vector in five dimensional space in that case, or, or here, n plus one dimensional space. Um, and it turns out that that space that you reconstruct with that vector is guaranteed to have a direct smooth relationship to mirror the underlying state space. Now you have to do this with a large enough N, but if so, it will be guaranteed to be kind of a, a just a twisted, compressed, squished, <laughs> version of the original state space, okay? Um, so here, ladies and gentlemen, we have these regularly spaced observations and we, we populate space with these vectors. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that this allows us to reconstruct the original system. It allows us to take a system and using data from just one time series from that system, from one particular point in that time series, one type of thing. Maybe it's new cases, for example, or maybe it's something like new hospitalizations from one thing in that system, one time series of one type of measuring. I can create these vectors for that, populate them, and I will find something that looks just like the underlying state space of the of the system. So this is a system called the Lorenz attractor. It's a famous chaotic system. 
uh, dynamical system. And using observations only about X, for example, I can do a reconstruction of that system. I can take X, that, that's the time series X. And by going through this process, I can create these vectors, plot them out in space, and I can do a 3D reconstruction, for example, of the structure, whoa, of the structure of this system. If this looks kind of like this, it's because I've reconstructed it from this time series alone. I only observe one type of thing here. I didn't, I only observe one of these dimensions, but I reconstructed the other dimensions from this time series. And it turns out this can be done in, in, in practical systems. And I did it for this model that's running here. So um, we can take that and with, with state space, we could look at, for example, hairs now versus hairs at time t minus one or links now versus links at time t minus one. I, I decided I would take hairs, this, uh, this time series of hairs, and I would plot it out in this embedded way, this way like, like this. Um, and what I found, and, and here we go, is this. So here we have this in this very high dimensional state space. I have taken just one type of measurement hairs, and I plot it out. So here we have X of T, here we have X minus tau, and there we have X minus two tau, exactly what we're dealing with here. And I've reconstructed the state space of the underlying system. And you notice there's kind of two modes it can get into. It can get into this mode and circle around the state space circles around this equilibrium, or it can be in here and kind of circulate around it. And you notice it looks a little bit two-dimensional. It's not quite three-dimensional. It's not occupying this entire state space. It's occupying kind of a, 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 a kind of a small surface on it. It's, it's a little bit fat, but it's, it's not occupying the entire state space. But it's evolving in this state space. And I reconstructed it, reconstructed this, just from that single variable on hairs. But this state space is guaranteed to encode information about links as well. It encodes information about all things driving the hair population. And this, this state space is not quite fully three-dimensional. It, it, it occupies only a, a small fraction of this. It's not leaping everywhere in this state space. And, and you could argue that parts of it are kind of closer to two dimensions. But ladies and gentlemen, the deeper point here is when we have data from the world that's coming from a coupled nonlinear dynamical system, even data from one stinking area of that system, a data about one type of thing from that system, will whisper to you about the, the whole system that's driving it it'll whisper to you about what's going on, not just about that one thing you happen to measure, but all the things driving it. So when we listen to hairs, we hear about links. When we listen, when we look at human cases of West Nile, we learn about birds, we learn about mosquitoes. When we look at new cases of COVID, we learn about undiagnosed infectives. Uh, we learn about people who are asymptomatic. We learn about people who are susceptible or recovered. We learn about the broader system because that broader system is a key driver for what we measure. I could talk about this much longer, but that's all we have time for today. I hope that gives you a first glimpse of some ways in which System science starts to come together with data. And that is a rich vein that we will be tapping into in future lectures on matters like calibration, where we'll be talking about ways in which we align models with data. But just remember these techniques are independent of models. I didn't depend on model structure in reconstructing this, uh, this state of the world. I didn't 
dependent on when reconstructing this. This is model three. It's free of assumptions about the models. That's all we have time for. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to meeting with you on Tuesday to jump into deepening our knowledge on system dynamics modeling and creating simpler, lower, lower dimensionality representations of these dynamical systems. Take care there. And I hope you are spared my current ailment. Take care. I will now be open for office hours.